Hi, this is Morgan Somerville, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy Regional Director. My name is Meryl Harrell. I am the Executive Director of the Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards. Hey everyone, and thanks for joining. My name is Dave Casey, and I'm the District Ranger on the Pisgah. My name is Clay Wooldridge. I'm the Director of the Cradle of Forestry with Find Outdoors. Uh, we were so sad to hear that we weren't going to be able to host the Wilderness Skills Institute at our campus this year. Some of us and many more would have been gathering at the Cradle of Forestry for the 10th Annual Wilderness Skills Institute to learn and work shoulder to shoulder in part partnership for wilderness, traditional skills, and trails. We're not able to do that this year and keep everyone safe. So even though you're not on the Pisgah National Forest physically, I consider it the home of Wilderness Skills Institute. So welcome to the Pisgah virtually. Things look a little different this year. One thing is you probably won't get rained on. But we are really thrilled to be able to offer these six sessions virtually. We hope that you share learning that you have freely and openly. As a former wilderness instructor myself, I know how important the community is to be able to come together and meet new people and to learn new skills and to see all those old faces that are out there doing the same kind of work that you're doing. And so I strongly encourage you just to take every opportunity you can uh, during this time to, to focus on cultivating those relationships. Because the community created around WSI is one of its greatest values. And we hope that this will help build our community of stewards so that we come through this time of challenge even stronger and more committed than ever before. Thanks again. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the Wilderness Skills Institute. 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 And welcome to the Wilderness Skills Institute. Uh, today we're going to be talking about natural disaster response and collaboration. And the agenda for the day is going to be Uh, well, we did some introductions. So um, next, John is going to talk about uh, natural disaster and emergencies, um, and then looking at what is a, an, an initial response versus what is an extended response. And then we'll also dive into uh, resource advisors or reads. Um, and then David Finnan is going to speak on his experience as a read and on a variety of different for, or fires across the country. And Kevin Vasilinda will um, talk about his experiences with storm damage down on the Kanasaga district in the Cahutta wilderness. And then Kevin Fitzsimmons uh, is going to give kind of a broad um, overview of his experiences, both as a field employee up to an administrative position. Um, and then I'll talk about Saw's experience um, as being a partner in responding uh, to these natural disasters. And so I'll pass it off to John now um, and feel free to put any questions in the chat. We have a variety of um, points throughout the presentation um, to answer those questions. All right, hey everybody. Uh, this is John Campbell. Like Katie said, I'm the Southern Region Wilderness and Wild and Scenic River Program Manager. Can everybody hear? Hey Katie, can you hear me? Before I go too far, I can hear you. Yep. Okay. Uh, maybe a couple of quick another, other housekeeping things. We really tried to monitor folks uh, getting into this meeting. If you have someone that you know is trying to get in, uh, send a chat through, and we can you know let us know what their name is. Uh, we we pretty much recognized everybody, but um, we really didn't want uh, to be Zoom bombed again. Uh, that definitely threw a loop for us, although it ended up being a great presentation last week. But if someone's having trouble, uh, send us a, a chat and we'll uh, we'll try to do that. So. Um, so this course at WSI was gonna be the first time that we offered something along these lines. Uh, and it came out of a discussion at the National Wilderness Workshop as we talked about uh, emergencies and natural disasters and different uh, laws that are in place, whether that be the Wilderness Act or the Wild and Scenic River Act, the National Historic and Scenic Trails Act, uh, lots of things and how they all work together. So we brainstormed the, this new course and we were gonna, you know, obviously have a little bit longer than an hour to an hour and a half to talk about this subject. Um, and we were also gonna uh, try to offer a resource advisor or read course. So you'll be hearing read probably throughout the rest of the day if you didn't know what that was. 
Uh, and we'll talk about maybe a little bit more about what that is later in the presentation. Um, so yeah, this is this is new material. Uh, you're getting this for the first time, as at least as it comes from the Wilderness Skills Institute planning team. Um, and it's definitely an overview. Uh, it's designed to maybe spark some conversations uh, and hear from folks that have experiences. Uh, I just realized as I'm presenting right now, I can't actually see the chat box. So, uh, but I know David and Katie and others are monitoring the chat box and will stop me along the way. So I highly encourage questions in the chat box uh, throughout the presentation. And if we don't stop right then, we'll, we'll catch it when we have a, a, a planned break to, to try to answer questions or have a conversation. Um, I was gonna try, I'm gonna try to be a little bit interactive on this. Uh, so, and, and maybe folks can, can, David and Katie can help me read off a few things, but um, as we look at emergencies and natural disasters, I, I think, you know, earlier in my career, that really was just wildfires. Um, and, you know, everybody knows about wildfires. It's a, a big part about, a big part of what the Forest Service does uh, across the country uh, and in the Southeast. Um, but it seems with more and more frequency, we're seeing tornadoes and hurricanes and wind events and floods, uh, and then not so much a natural disaster is search and rescue. Um, but they, they kind of get lumped together as we're gonna talk about this course a little bit. Uh, man, and they're just, they're all a little bit different. Um, and they, they present challenges uh, to local managers and folks in the field as to, to how to deal with them, especially when it comes to wilderness. Um, so I had a quick little exercise in the chat box um, for you to just a one word or two word thing of a, of a emergency you've dealt with before or uh, you know a name storm. I know since I've been in this position we've dealt with uh, Hurricane Harvey or not Harvey but Irma um, and Maria down in Puerto Rico. Um, but feel free to type a, a quick little thing in the chat uh, about something you've dealt with from an emergency standpoint. and, and uh, we can look at those or if there's any questions. I'm just curious what folks were saying and uh, Katie or David, if something pops up that is interesting, feel free to, uh, to, to see it. Plenio said tornado cleanup. Tornado cleanup, yep. I'm curious if anyone has done any kind of uh, natural disaster emergency response that's not listed. Uh, on the, the PowerPoint there, uh, in case I'm just missing something. Yep, more hurricanes, Western North Carolina fires of 2016, inland hurricanes. Yep. Um, Jason was working with military intelligence during 9-11 which cool. is another form of disaster. Search and rescue, landslides, yep. flooding. I'm actually, it's great. I just, I just realized how to uh, find the chat. Perfect. <laughs> I'll let you take over then. Oh, landslides, for sure. That's, uh, that's great, uh, Carter. Yeah, and the, actually the, the one other one that I thought about uh, just now was we've responded to airplane crashes uh, in wilderness, which is definitely, uh, you know, trigger some emergency protocols. There you go, Merrill, current pandemic, definitely different. And we're, we're you know, this, we're, this is happening in real time for all of us and how we're gonna deal with that. So I, I agree completely. All right, uh, awesome. Thanks for, for putting that in there. There we go. So just a quick summary. Uh, this would have been a little bit more of a presentation uh, when we probably had a day or more to talk about this. Just a quick little hit on a couple key points of the Wilderness Act and why things are a little bit different in wilderness. Uh, you know, our primary mandate from the Wilderness Act is to preserve wilderness character. Um, and as you can see there, I've listed the, the Section 4C prohibited uses. Um, and that's what we're gonna be dealing with a lot of times in this case is we have an emergency and how we respond uh, may need to use prohibited uses uh, and may or may not need to impact wilderness character. 
uh, and many folks on this call uh, probably are going to be people working to address the rehabilitation, the assessment, the needs that are out there, and, and trying to do it in a way that minimizes impact to the wilderness care. And I just wanted to make that connection, that that goes right back to the Wilderness Act, and the, the legal mandate as to what we're supposed to be doing out there. Uh, emergencies aside, that should be where we start, and then we, we move forward from there. So directly right out of the Forest Service manual, uh, this is uh, allow the use of motorized mechanized transport for emergencies where the situation involves an inescapable urgency and temporary need for speed beyond that is available by primitive means. Includes fire suppression, health and safety, others, that type of thing. Um, the trick here uh, on this part and why I put this in here is it's critical to know when that emergency ends. Um, and I'll maybe just throw out a couple of uh, um, scenarios here in a minute just to, to talk through. Uh, but it's also very important to recognize, and I think we're gonna hear this from our panel folks later on, is that these, these situations, these emergencies uh, can be very sensitive. We need to have really good situational awareness uh, as we work through them. If we are the, the quote wilderness specialist uh, or someone working on the, the resource advisor side of, of any kind of emergency. Uh, because as we all know, um, politics, past emergencies, some folks risk, risk tolerance all play into how these decisions are made and how these uh, situations unfold. Um, some are a little more slow moving than others and others are you know, moving uh, literally at the pace of a you know, wildfire uh, and going really quickly. So um, we need to make sure we're balancing our uh, our beliefs and how we want to advocate for wilderness and have some real good context as to what uh, lo local leaders, uh, you know, external leaders uh, and emergency response personnel are dealing with. So just for fun, I came up with a couple of, couple of things I'm just going to run through. So um, is a lost hiker that is not injured and has communication, obviously, obviously they called 911. Does that qualify as an emergency? Um, in most situations, I'm probably gonna think no. Uh, but sometimes some, uh, some, sometimes they're gonna think they need to get out, like they, they're panicking. And also the folks responsible for emergency response and search and rescues uh, on most forests are your county EMS and other groups like that. And you know their their primary charge is to go out there. There's still conversations to be had about those things, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that down the road. But those are things you can address ahead of time, uh, as you work with local uh, EMS groups uh, on what the the tolerances are for when when we can you know go in uh, with everything we have to help somebody versus when we need to show a little restraint. Um, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of flooding out there, uh, and we're there's usually a pretty big push to understand what the damage is that's happened out there. And, uh, you know, do we need to get a helicopter out to go check out what the damage is immediately uh, or, you know, land on a helipad? Um, those are things that may come across your desk in the future. Um, and, and those are they're, it's a tricky one to, to handle. Um, you know, we've got some kind of wind event, tornado or a microburst or even hurricane type stuff. And there's an actual injured camper uh, in a wilderness area. You know, we're not, there's going to be a lot of folks ready to go out and get that done. And most likely that's going to happen. When someone's injured, when we're talking life, uh, uh, life and limb, um, we're going to go in and, and help people the best we can as quickly as we can. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, a week after a storm event, we've got uh, inaccessible uh, rec sites or trails or popular areas. Um, and it's, it's one week after the event, there's nobody out there. Uh, this is one of the, you know, it's come up a couple of times is we shouldn't, uh, a week after the event is over, there's probably no emergencies out there. Uh, we need to go out and do an assessment and, and talk through what the proper response is as we deal with recreational access uh, and other work that needs to be done. And we'll continue to talk about a couple of these themes uh, throughout the rest of the day. So minimum requirements analysis. Uh, 
I think most folks have heard about this. This is could be up to a full day course uh, at, at any other training opportunity. Uh, but I'm just going to hit on it quickly just to note that emergencies are technically not exempt from the minimum requirement. Um, as you can see over there uh, in 4C, except as necessary to meet the minimum requirements for administration of this area. Emergencies are administration, so there is an exemption, but we need to think through our processes to how we approve uh, what we're going to do in response to these emergencies. Um, let's see here. This is where I wanted to mention, as you, you do planning for whether it be search and rescue or other natural da disaster responses, you can work through some of these issues beforehand and programmatically uh, to understand, you know, make sure you, when you're dealing with it in the heat of the moment, that's a much different thing to when, hey, we have a plan for in case we do have, uh, you know, trapped individuals or, you know, trail assessment work that needs to be done, a variety of things. You can kind of have a plan in place uh, and there's some out there and, and I'd recommend checking out Wilderness Connect. You can see how some of those programmatic MRAs are done, uh, wilderness plans, you know, that, that address some of these issues. And just as a note, I didn't have this in here, just doing a minimum requirements analysis for those of you that, that uh, know about that, that doesn't mean you have to go through a minimum requirements decision guide or an MRDG. This is a thought process that you can sometimes, in, when there is, when time is of the essence, you talk through this and, and you document it uh, in a short statement or in a conversation that here's why we, here's how we landed at this as we considered impacts to wilderness character and, and doing the minimum. This is just a little uh, joke to get you guys laughing. Uh, this is in a few of the Carhartt presentations. It's the one I use in MRAs as well. Um, a lot of times we, we get the, here's, you know, we need to do, you know what the decision is, and then you get the analysis to match it up. Um, I, that doesn't happen all the time. It, it, it is uncommon these days, but uh, just a little something to make you, you guys laugh. All right, this is a really helpful table. Um, and if we have, if you have an interest uh, and you know someone that can get in touch with me or anyone on the planning team, I can send you this in a document. Also, this rec this uh, this presentation will be recorded as well. Um, but this is a really helpful uh, table for who holds the authority for emergencies and non-emergencies. Uh, you can see the regional forester holds everything for motorized mechanized requests and non-emergency. And it goes down to the forest soup when we're in an, in an emergency, other than tractors and heavy equipment uh, in wilderness is at the regional forester level. Uh, that's why it's very important, uh, like I mentioned early on, is we need to really define when we're in emergency and when we're in not. Uh, the actual natural disaster as it's happening and uh, doing an assessment to make sure there is nobody injured or hurt or immediate uh, life and limb needs out there. Um, in most cases, the emergency is going to be ended at that point. Um, there's lots of stuff in our policy, and I can't go into it too depth as it relates to fire. A lot of this stuff is geared towards fire as well. Um, but uh, this is a handy tool for those of you that work uh, out in the field uh, to make sure you can be given proper advice uh, as these things come up. So the initial response, um, this is, it's really important when something does happen uh, on a district or somewhere on your forest, identify who that local person, your local wilderness specialist, or uh, if you're fortunate to have a read on, on your unit, um, make sure that that person is in communication with leadership uh, and other folks. Uh, it may be necessary for you to go out and insert yourself into early discussions. Um, it's really important to be out in front of those early discussions because once a plan's in place, it's really going to be hard to go backwards. Uh, and may, it doesn't, doesn't look good to where we have to back up on an emergency response uh, because of wilderness. But if you're at the table early on and understanding what's going on, providing feedback, giving them a thumbs up or a, hey, we need to look at this a little bit differently, um, 
it's great to be right there at the very beginning. And it, like I said, it might require you to, you know, say, hey, I have some input on this project. Because uh, a lot of times a wilderness person might not be the first person that gets called in an emergency, uh, even if it's in wilderness. Uh, you know, there's a certain set of, you know, other folks think differently sometimes. So uh, try to get out there as quickly as you can. Um, the assessment uh, is really important to have accurate and timely information. Um, you know, once, like I said, once the emergency is over and we're out and we're, you know, oh man, there's, you know, five, 700 trees down or this bridge is blown out or uh, a variety of other things that could have happened because of this natural disaster. Um, you know, we need to make sure we're taking the time to assess the whole thing before we start doing it, you know, any kind of, uh, making decisions on how we're going to address the the impacts and the damage and do the rehabilitation. Um, it's a, got to be a, a very well thought out process, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, when you start doing a piecemeal and getting maybe not the greatest of accurate information, that's going to lead to challenges down the road um, and doesn't make it any easier to, to move forward. So. Uh, focus on your priorities, major safety hazards, other major hazards that may be out there if the public can get there. Um, focus on those uh, as opposed to focusing on reopening. Um, that's that's one of the important things that, that I've seen in a couple of examples that, that I've had uh, in my current role. Um, as the if if you're working as the wilderness uh, specialist on this type of uh, event, um, the messaging about wilderness to the public is going to be very important. Um, you know, we don't it doesn't want to seem like we're not doing anything because it's in wilderness. Uh, but sometimes that spin can be put on it. Uh, it's making sure that folks understand why we're why it's a little bit different and why we're approaching certain things in the, the way that they're being approached. Uh, and like I said talking in very generalities here because each situation is going to be very different. Um, but kind of giving you a little tickler list here to, to have in your back pocket um, if this does, does ever come up. Uh, and as always, um, work with your partners. That includes your stewardship partners like SAWS, uh, ATC, all of the AT maintaining clubs, um, uh, your local search and rescue folks, uh, state, county, city, municipal groups uh, are usually involved in emergencies if they're in their particular jurisdiction. Uh, it's really important to coordinate with them because they all have roles. Uh, they're usually part of your community um, and it's so important to, to keep them in the loop as you work through a lot of this stuff. So a little bit on the extended response. Um, and that's where, this is kind of where wilderness uh, management comes in a little bit more. You get this opportunity to reevaluate. Um, you know, a lot of times an, an act of nature is a, a great opportunity to say, hey, do we really want that there? Or do we really need that resource? Um, you know, we don't have a lot of things in wilderness we don't want, but there may be an opportunity to reevaluate sometimes. Trail bridges, non-compliant infrastructure, high density camp areas. You know, we shouldn't rush to put it back the exact same way that it was, uh, especially in, in certain situations where it might be, uh, you know, a prohibited use or something like that. Uh, in most cases, yeah, we're gonna reopen our trails. Hey, maybe it's in a spot where we need to reroute. Let's go ahead and think about that. Um, so that's a great opportunity and the, that wilderness specialist, um, or the read, uh, our partners, that's where it's going to be important to have your voice heard in some of those conversations. Um, like I said, I think reopening becomes, you know, part of a emergency response sometimes when we should be making some, going through some thought processes and conscious decision-making uh, as to what's gonna be the future of these particular resources in, in a wilderness area. And like on the last slide initial, um, you know, communication, internal, external, it's a great opportunity to talk to folks about wilderness, educate, um, wilderness awareness, 
uh, a lot of folks just maybe just don't know it's it's a little bit different out there and this is a great opportunity and hopefully we can share success stories and and why what we're trying to promote is good for the resource uh, on the ground so just always continuing those communications and most wilderness areas have a wilderness education plan if not all of them in the southern region we pull that out and use some of those resources to, to talk to folks. Um, external resources. Um, one example I wanted to bring up, because I think we'll get into probably a little bit more with the panel folks. Uh, when I first started in this job, uh, I left the Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest. Uh, and a couple months later, I believe it was Hurricane Irma, came in and just did a number uh, on a few wilderness areas and the Appalachian Trail. And there was a lot that went on on that. And man, so many people work so hard to make that happen. But the example, the thing I wanted to bring up with this one is I was new to this job and I put out a call to my counterparts in the other regions. And you know, the Western summer season was wrapping up and I said, hey, we've got a, a situation where we had several hundred or more into the thousands maybe of trees down through a variety of wilderness areas. Uh, you know, and we've got the, the southbound through hike season finishing up and um, we wanna get this trail open and get the Appalachian Trail open. And I, I think I had in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 responses, anywhere from single resources to entire hotshot crews, um, willing to come out, basically. And I believe the, the forest took advantage of a couple of folks that came out, helped do assessment, helped do some work. Uh, Saws was out there, obviously ATC and the Georgia Appalachian Trail Club was out there. Um, and I, I, you know, I think, it got done with no chainsaws and in a fairly timely manner. Um, and, and I hopefully folks weren't too inconvenienced on the trail, but that was literally my first, uh, my first thing I dealt with when I came into this job and, and worked a lot with the forest folks. And, uh, you know, I knew there were so many other folks out on the ground. So um, I consider that one a success story and uh, in, in, in how it was accomplished and how many folks came together to make it happen. So uh, that was really good. And then the last thing with extended response that I wanted to mention was the Burned Area Emergency Rehabilitation or BEAR program. Um, this is where when you have a wildfire, there's opportunities for uh, some specialized funding to do rehabilitation work out there. Um, and I highly recommend um, that you get involved in that request, whether that be for trail work, uh, you know, prepping for invasive species infestations, uh, anything else that you might need is be involved in what needs to happen in your wilderness area and take advantage of, of that funding. Uh, it's an important one and uh, yeah, there, I think we'll talk probably maybe a little bit more about that uh, later on. Uh, Then this is my last slide, and then uh, you guys can ask me any questions you want. I believe is, is we'll have that a little break. Uh, so a resource advisor. Um, this course was originally designed uh, to offer a read course, a certification, the N9042 official training through the um, National Wildfire Coordinating Group. Um, I, I have not been actively involved in fire since really early in my career, um, but this is a you know, you, you get qualifications and you're, you're ready to go out on a fire. And uh, I work pretty extensively with our regional fire group. They have, uh, for those of you that are involved in fire, they have a huge training network um, and offer things at fire academies and, and all other kinds of stuff. So uh, in the future, we do hope to hold that course that would, we would have a particular wilderness spin on it. Um, but obviously that wasn't going to happen this year. So I, uh, the role of a read is to advise line officers and agency administrators. Uh, like I mentioned early on, it's really important to balance your role as a as an advocate for the resource versus supporting the emergency response uh, folks leading that. Um, and and it, there's probably some balance there. And I think our our panel members will talk about that a little bit more. I've never I'm I just received my read certification uh, earlier this year, but I obviously have not been out as a read. So uh, um, I'm, I'm looking to learn as well from folks that have gone out and done it. Um, uh, a read has, you can be any kind of specialist for a read. I think it's almost, uh, there's no 
a set number on what it could be. You could be a botany read, you could be an archaeologist read. Uh, obviously, our focus is a wilderness read, and I think it's probably one of the more common ones. Um, but I did want to note that they're kind of two different roles. Uh, you can go out on a detail and, you know, be on a, uh, any emergency, probably a wildfire, and, you know, be embedded with a, a team and you're providing re uh, guidance and recommendations to that local incident team. But more important, where I see reads as being very important is at the local level, is having one, uh, you know, on a district that can advise local line officers when things do come up quickly. Um, I, I think it's a great role. I, my predecessors in this position and others, I think that was why this, the training for the wilderness reads kind of took off and was to have these folks out there that could, could advise these folks. Um, and one other part it's great to have local folks too is as we're completing uh, the minimum requirements analysis approvals, the MRDGs, uh, a lot of times one of the requirements uh, to implement the project, depending on what it is, is that a read or some kind of wilderness specialist will be assigned to that project to make sure it gets implemented as properly approved um, through the process. So uh, it's becoming more and more important program. I'm going to let the others talk about the value of reads and what they've seen. Uh, I will mention too, I think hopefully coming down the road to the Forest Service is something called an all hazard read. Um, the, the course I attended was taught by the Park Service and I think we had like 30 or 40 Park Service ecologists from all over the country taking this, it's called an all hazard read program, where they're responding to hurricanes, tornadoes, other natural disasters, uh, because they're usually, at least in the Southeast and the couple of folks I talked to, they're managing some very sensitive ecosystems like swamps and uh, seashores, very unique habitats, and they're going in and helping to respond to those. So uh, I think hopefully that will start making its way into Forest Service policy a little bit in the future. Um, and I think it would be a, a good thing. So uh, that's my uh, quick little intro for hopefully only about 15 minutes. Oh, I went maybe a little bit longer than I should have. I, so I'll open it up for questions and I'll, I'll stop talking now. So I'll look at the one question here from Eric. Any knowledge or examples of successful examples of MOUs between FS and county search and rescues? Um, I, I, there, there are some examples uh, on Wilderness Connect. Um, what the more successful model that I've been seeing for folks that have, you know, kind of these recurring search and rescue stuff is just to maintain a great relationship with them, have regular meetings. Uh, because once you get an MOU put together, any or all of the participants that were a party to it may move on to other jobs. Um, so it's a matter of just, you know, staying in close contact with those folks um, to understand what those require. And, they'll, and they'll, they'll want to call you when there is a problem, especially if it's during kind of regular business hours. Some things that happen when folks aren't monitoring their phone, that's, that's another thing. But I... That's one of my big recommendations, but there are some successful examples on Wilderness Connect. All right, I don't see any more questions. Uh, should I move on to the next slide, Katie? Yep, that sounds good. Oh, Plinio has one comment. said he's joined a monthly meeting of our local fire department to discuss wilderness and wild and scenic rivers, shared maps, and discussed I ideal case scenarios, do's and don'ts. That's awesome. I, I think that's at least a successful path that I've been hearing other than, you know, an MOU of some kind. Um, not to say that couldn't help. If you can get it on paper and everyone wants to do it, I think that's a great thing. Uh, but staying in close contact with those organizations is, is your really uh, one of your best bets. 
All right, be ready, everybody. I'm in charge of this show and technology is not my favorite, so I'm gonna see what I can do here. Here we go. Mr. Finnan, you're up. Ooh. All right, you got me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, I'm David Finnan and uh, I'm the wilderness ranger on the Pisco Ranger District for Shining Rock Middle Prong Wilderness Areas. And uh, just to give you a brief background, I've, uh, I've been with the Forest Service for um, just under 20 years. I, I started in 01 and uh, was a primary firefighter up until 2006. In 2006, I came to the Pisgah as a wilderness ranger and I've been there ever since. Um, I, um, I started as a wilderness fire read in 2011 and I had been on several, um, initial attacks and several extended attacks on neighboring districts. But, um, uh, in 2016, I was on, uh, during, during the fall fire season that was so bad here in the uh, Southern Alps. I was the uh, resource advisor on the on the Maple Springs fire in Joyce Kilmer and um, Joyce Kilmer and um, Slick Rock Wilderness areas. And leading up to that time, most of my assignments had been pretty laid back. Um, I'd show up and I'd get lined out or I would talk to the uh, agency representative and we'd talk about the strategies they've been using. This time I was literally met at Wendy's, was told to follow the um, agency administrator and went straight to the fire line to talk with the division supervisors and we had a map out and uh, they asked me what I would do. So I was impressed with that. Usually the reads don't, aren't, aren't talked to like that by division supervisors. The read is the last person they want to see. So it was a sense of relief for them to see me come because uh, I don't think they had dealt with many wilderness fires up until that point. And so um, we, we started talking strategy and the biggest thing was saving um, ancient tulip poplars in um, Joyce Kilmer. And I'm sure many of you have been there, some of you at least. Um, it's a uh, it's a loop trail that has some of the most outstanding old growth um, anywhere in Western North Carolina. And a lot of that old growth is uh, tulip poplar trees. And the thing about tulip poplars is uh, they have a shallow root system. So they have exposed roots. And the, the fear was that the fire was gonna cross the drainage that it was held up in in slick rock, um, make a run uphill and um, probably kill these trees because it wasn't going to take a lot of heat and the way the fire season had been going um, they were burning hot they were burning very hot and they were burning deep so um, we did a walk through with, uh, with the botanist and we came up with two plans one was using pumps and we would draft water from uh, a local spring probably a good 50 yards um, from where we needed the sprinklers. So it was going to take a lot of hose. It was going to take multiple pumps. And um, it was going to take a lot of, uh, it was going to take a lot of bodies um, to help get hose lays out. Um, they were going to be creating user created trails. Um, once an operation like that starts, you're constantly checking on pumps. Chances are you've got somebody with the pump, make sure it runs. At the same time, you've got water resources and you have to have everything in place to protect that water resource from, uh, from fuel and things like that involved with operating the pump. So we came up with a second plan and that plan was merely to go around all, as many trees as we could locate um, within sight of the trail, within sight of the loop trail, um, and in some cases a little a little further out. And so we counted trees, we marked them with GPS, uh, marked each coordinate with the GPS, and we turned in a map basically. And then we came back out and we, we prepped the trees by blowing leaves, any debris, any type of uh, depth layer that were over root systems and made a defensible area. And the plan was if the fire 
jumped um, jumped the creek, jumped the drainage it was in, and made them run. We could burn off from those trees at a lower intensity fire with a lower intensity fire backing on down to the main fire. And so that experience that I carried from having done prescribed fire in areas like the Crotan National Forest, where they um, they have to uh, prep red cockaded woodpecker trees, uh, trees that the uh, red cockaded put woodpecker um, find most desirable, and that's the longleaf white or the longleaf pine. And so, typically, before we do a burn, we prep the trees, we we cut all the vegetation around it. So. Where I'm going with that, I brought those skills as a wildland firefighter and uh, prescribed fire crew member back to this, uh, back to my reed position. And so we were able to get around all the trees uh, that we identified. We were able to create a defensible area. And each day, two leaf blowers went out and um, just refurbished what we had done the day before because uh, we were in a fall and, and, and trees were still hanging on the leaves, leaves were falling. So that, that's, that's a good example of, of just working with uh, division supervisors, working with the IC in fact. I was, uh, I was pulled from, from many different angles from division supervisors, the IC wanted to talk, um, we had the, uh, the district ranger who uh, I talked with a lot and um, luckily the fire stayed hung up in the drainage and, and we didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to burn off the trees like uh, we thought we may have to. And um, so it all ended well. There, there's a lot of rehabilitation or, or repair left. Um, somebody, I think in one of the um, chat, in, in the chat room mentioned that uh, they had been in uh, Joyce Kilmer Slick Rock, Rock to, uh, probably cross cut side a lot of the uh, trees that have fallen. Um, I'm sure reinforcing new trail, re, re, rerouting trail because of the impact. But uh, it's, it's one of those examples where things could have been a lot worse. Um, as far as experience out west, in 2017, I was uh, called out to the Lions Fire on the uh, Sierra National Forest. and this was right in the heart, right in the heart of the Sierra Nevadas. It was the uh, Ansel Adams fire. It was so remote that we spiked out on the fire and uh, we were brought in by, by helicopter. So there are a lot of moving parts there too. Um, this fire had been going pretty much the entire summer from June through, I think it wound up being declared out sometime in September and October. I was there in August. so. Most of the suppression was done. They had a they had a few hot spots, but my primary mission was to uh, come up with a repair plan and um, coordinating through a, a, a lead read who compiled all the information the field reads were bringing in and um, coming up with a plan there. Um, we ran in we we ran into things I I didn't think would happen. Um, because of the remote area of this fire and some of the historic values that were there. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of artifacts left over by Native Americans. We had archeologists. We also had structures that uh, had been there since the um, mid to late 19th century. So there was a lot of protection there and that was just outside of wilderness. Um, and there was also a wooden uh, bridge that they were trying to protect. It took you out of wilderness into uh, just basically across the boundary. But what they had done, it was so remote, they had, they had spiked in, in one area 60 crews, or I'm sorry, I take that back, 20 crews with 60 individuals. And so it became a juggling act of dealing with waste, human waste and, and waste from, uh, from food, that kind of thing. And so that one, that one probably came close to being a nightmare for the district, considering some of the things we were dealing with, but it was definitely something I have never dealt with. And um, there are other things that had occurred on the fire that probably could have been handled a little differently. I'm, I'm sure things that we would have handled differently in region eight. Um, and so as a matter of just, you know, logging each day, saying what we did, keeping a journal and, 
at the end, at the end of uh, my two week detail, bring that into the lead read and sit down with the recreation folks, recreation managers, and just talk to them about what we found, back it up with photos and just kind of suggest maybe, maybe they might think about getting together some type of resources to plan ahead for, for another fire there because it was a definite fire prone area. There had been fires uh, years before, um, leading right up to a couple years before this fire. So they, they were getting them and um, they were real receptive. They were, they were very thankful that myself and several other reeds went over with what we found and, and offered these suggestions. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised at how how they received us and um, it it wound up being probably one of my better read assignments just because of the challenges that uh, we were faced with. So that's about all I've got. I, I think I've probably talked at least 10 minutes um, and I would welcome any questions too. I'd be happy to answer um, if you have any. Hey, Ronnie, if you have a question for David, type it in the chat, or uh, if we have time at the very end as well, we'll have a, another question session. All right, we're going to move on to our next presenter, uh, Kevin Vasalinda on the Conestoga Ranger District. Don't forget to unmute, Kevin. Hello? We can hear you. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm going to try to share my screen, too. I pulled up some photographs um, to show everybody. Let's see. No, nope, not let me. All right. Well, anyways, my name is Kevin Vasseland. I'm the Wilderness uh, Ranger and Trails Technician on the Conestoga Ranger District, um, Chattahoochee National Forest. Um, I help manage the Cahutta Wilderness, which... Um, is the largest forest service wilderness in region eight with just a couple asterisks. And um, if I need to fill some time in at the end of the, uh, my session, I can go over the asterisks, but that's fine. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you about some of my strategies with dealing with um, uh, the natural disasters that we've been experiencing over the last um, handful of years. Um, like Finnan, I have um, kind of a dual background. I, I started off in primary fire and then switched over to wilderness. Um, just shy of 15 years, and I've been working on the Conestoga um, for seven now with the Cahutta Wilderness. Um, everything was fairly calm when I got there. Um, you know, there was a tornado in 2011. It was one of the genesis of the SALS program. Some other folks can tell you that story, but um, that's how um, Bill used to tell it. And um, everything was pretty quiet on the Conestoga until about 2016. And similarly to um, what Finnan was talking about, um, we, we had a, a very bad drought here in the southeast, and the Cahutta Wilderness got a single lightning strike fire. Um, hey, Kevin, this is John, not to interrupt. I think try to share your screen one more time. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do here, yep. I'm trying to talk and do that at the same time. Oh, yep. Oh. Ah, don't worry about it. Let, I can't figure it out. But anyways, um, in um, early October, or late September, early October, we got a single lightning uh, strike in the Cahutta Wilderness, um, soon known as the Rough Ridge Fire, burned 28,000 acres of the Cahutta Wilderness. Um, in... Um, Years after that, we've had some satellite uh, imagery of the area. We realized we've lost um, six to 7,000 acres of overstory canopy. Most of that was Virginia pine stands, but it also thinned a lot of other um, hardwood stands and species out. Um, since then, we've been just plagued with thunderstorms. Um, in 2017, uh, we had a thunderstorm come in early summer 
and um, microburst um, throughout, leave microburst throughout the northwest corner of the wilderness. Um, just so happens that the northwest corner of the Cahuta Wilderness is also uh, where we found most of the six to seven thousand acres of um, impacted overstory. Um, Interesting enough there, again, in 2018, we got another thunderstorm into Calamity Corner, or the northwest corner of the Cahutta Wilderness, laying down straight line winds. That's one of the photographs I was trying to share with everybody. Um, we had several um, straight line swaths, uh, 500 yards in length, anywhere from 100 yards to 50 yards wide, and just laying them down uh, like a cone went through the woods. Uh, some of these uh, wind, some of this wind damage was inside the fire footprint, and some of this uh, damage was outside the fire footprint, um, leading you to believe that you know the fire did cause a lot of impact, but the drought itself uh, had a lot of impact on, on the land and the tree species as well. Um, 2019 was was kind of quiet. Of course, we had some. Uh, some thunderstorms is bringing down trees, nothing more. But then again, this year, um, as some of you know, we had the eastern tor Easter tornadoes uh, tore through Chatsworth and Chattanooga. And in between both of them and slightly to the east is the Cahutta Wilderness. And we got significant wind storms in there. Um, one of the main trails in Calamity Corner, in the northwest corner of the Cahuttas, is um, Rice Camp. And we are, we have about 100 trees down on Rice Camp again, it's four miles long, and that's the third time in four years we've had 100 trees down on that trail. So, um, I, I got a little bit of experience, at least since 2016, um, dealing with these kind of impacts in the wilderness. And I'm going to go over with you how, um, my thought process on how I, um, uh, take a look and, and kind of line up the work the best I can. Um, the most important part is, is to take the long view. Uh, wilderness is the enduring, uh, enduring resource. So, you know, like John was saying, like Finn was saying, you know, everybody wants to jump in there and get it done, get it fixed, get it back the way it was. It, and that's, that's not, that's not exactly the strategy for wilderness. We, we want to take the long view. We want to do things right. And um, we want to make sure we're not trammeling and, and not bending it to our will. Uh, saying I've, I, I've kind of come up with, I've been trying to, um, wilderness is not in the way of, of the trails. The trails are in the way of the wilderness. So, you know, these disturbances are natural, uh, whether they be wind, fire, either anthropogenic fire, whether you want to have that debate or not. All these disturbances, they've happened. They, they continue to happen. And just because they're blocking the trails doesn't make them any less or more natural. So we got to keep that in mind. Um, so when you do have a wind event, um, first thing I... I like to do, what everybody needs to do, is to survey, survey the damage. We need to get out there. Um, you know, I, I put a lot of miles in trying to get around um, to see, see where this wind damage is. Um, folks like myself are spread pretty thin. We have trails both in and outside of wilderness. Matter of fact, I just found some uh, wind damage from the Easter, e Easter tornadoes. Um, outside of wilderness, um, on just outside of one of our campgrounds, um, which was interesting to find. But, you know, we all got a lot of trails that we manage, and if a tree hits the ground, falls across the trail, and, and no one tells us about it, 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 it kind of like it doesn't, it, it's kind of like it doesn't exist. So, um, getting out there, looking, utilizing volunteers, and having a network of folks, uh, trusted core volunteers that can work autonomously to help you do some of the survey work is very important. Um, I also like to utilize social media. I'm, I'm, um, I'm not as into it as some people, but um, the Cahutta Wilderness does have a Facebook group, a, 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 um, a public Facebook group, not associated with the Forest Service. And folks, you know, 
uh, post on there a lot, and sometimes they talk about trail conditions. Um, and once you start gathering your, the information, figuring out where the trail damage or trail impacts are, uh, mostly looking for damage, it's important to get that information out. And the sooner you can get the information out, the better and the less, you know, complaints we may uh, receive from the public. Because um, some of these um, impacts that we've been dealing with throughout the region, you know, have shut down sections of trails for, for quite some time. Uh, in the last several years, since 2016, uh, we've closed the Cahutta to visitors, either part or whole, for several months for the last, or for three out of the last four years. And, and we did that for public safety and to allow us to figure out the extent of damage and, and help us uh, get some of that mitigated before we let folks get back in there, uh, not only for their own safety, but to prevent uh, further resource damage um, from that. So once you got, you've gathered your information, you've, you've gotten it out, and uh, the reason I point that out another is um, we have mixed use in the Cahuta Wilderness, um, not just hiking, but also horseback riding, and um, a lot of blowdowns. It, it may not be too big of a hindrance for hikers and, and even backpackers with the heavy loads, but it gets real dangerous real fast for people on horseback. Um, especially trails on, on um, heavy side slope. So that's where, um, when I start seeing a lot of um, uh, uh, impact to um, horseback riding in the wilderness, I like to try to get something on the Facebook page to get those folks um, a heads up about it. A lot of them traveled a long ways with the tra uh, horse trailers on gravel roads, and, and um, it's good to give them information as soon as possible. So once you get um, get your information, uh, I like to triage it the best I can. Um, first and foremost, of course, we're looking for resource damage, um, whether that's how many trees are on the ground. Is it a lot of bowls, you know, the main stem of the trees across the trail, or is it a lot of crowns in the trail? That's, that's a different workload and a different uh, level of expertise you need to clear those. Um, different tools as well so it's good to understand what you're dealing with. Also looking for root pools um, or small landslides um, that were associated with the wind damage or the flood or whatever impact we're dealing with um, and we, we um, obviously deal with those differently than we do with downed trees so we're, we're, we're trying to gather what kind of damage um, we have out there and we're also looking for walk-arounds to uh, folks making social trails around down trees. Um, so uh, and these are the uh, sorts of impacts we're looking for to try to mitigate as soon as possible. We're trying to look at where there's clusters of those um, to get the most bang for our buck when we get folks out there to work. Um, other ways, you know, the extent of the resource damage is, is first and foremost on our triaging. Um, but we also want to take into consideration the popularity and the usage of trails. Like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, trails that have horseback riding associated with them are on the top of my list to get uh, taken care of. At least the brushing um, to help uh, allow that user group to access the trail again. And um, once you start figuring out where your work is and what kind of work um, uh, you have, it's, it's, start, it's time to start getting um, your local resources and your volunteers and your partner groups out to work. I, that's usually what I do um, when I get reports of this and start getting my um, head wrapped around. I usually have a, a phone call with Katie and David, um, seeing, seeing what their workload and if they have any available uh, crews. Also John Campbell to see if uh, stuff like, if I can um, get some resources from there. Um, then I take my triaging and information that I've gathered and start um, finding, tar uh, start targeting areas. Um, 
I also like to start um, as soon as possible getting out there with hand saws um, and start at least prepping trees for cross cuts. Cross cutting, it, it's kind of almost like stonework. It's a specialized tool. Um, you, need, you need specialized training to take care of it. Hand saws, not so much. Um, the work is still dangerous and just as laborious, but it doesn't take the specialized tool and training to take care of it. And, you know, a good day of hand sawing through an area significantly impacted by downed trees can make a huge difference and at least allow the user back on the trail um, in the interim before you can get all the trees, uh, the step overs and the cross cut size trees out of the way. Also, one thing um, we've been experiencing in the Cahuttas is um, since we have lost um, significant stands of timber that some of the trail corridors go through, um, they're getting a lot more sunlight and we're getting a lot of herbaceous and briar growth uh, on some of those trails. And we were, you know, we were very focused, um, you know, cut the trees, uh, Tree, uh, cross cut in, uh, brushing back the, um, the limbs and stuff, and we fell behind on the blackberry growth. And now we're dealing with um, a large amount of uh, blackberry growth that we got to go in and sling blade. So that's a, a secondary issue you may run into, especially if you've lost um, a lot of timber in a, in a small area. Um, we're also dealing with, on top of that, we've, got, we've fallen so far behind on sling blading on some of our trails that the hardwood regen coming up in it has already um, outsized sling blades. So we're talking about hardwoods, maples, poplars, uh, bigger than your thumb, Virginia pines as well coming in, uh, bigger than your thumb, and they're getting to the point that it's a little much for a sling blade, which is a very efficient tool if you've used them, and now we're having to back up and um, actually lop uh, a lot of um, small uh, tree saplings off the trail shoulders. Another problem that we've been dealing with um, beyond your typical um, trail maintenance kind of um, issues is um, if you have these wind events, these fire events that are opening up the canopy, bringing a lot of um, sunlight down to the forest floor that never was there before, you get a lot of growth, a lot of growth of a lot of different things, and, and you have a, a good opportunity for invasive species coming in. Um, some of you have heard the Cahutas uh, have um, we had a huge polonia outbreak. Um, we've been trying to uh, get after it, and we've we've had some uh, some stewardship days, some some work days, and, and even a, a saws crew in there a couple of years ago. Um, and I guess I'll back up, tell you, uh, and I give you an idea of how bad the problem uh, has been getting. But the saws folks, uh, a, a typical hitch at seven or eight days, nine if I remember correctly, obviously not. But anyways, um, a six-person crew um, manually uh, shrank or cut them off at the stump, uh, 13,000 polonias. And they were just working the trail corridor. They weren't working throughout the uh, – the wilderness, you're off trail, if you will, but just along the trail corridors in a standard hitch, they, they, um, they hit more than 13,000 of them. And unfortunately, as great of a job as that was, it, it really was just scratching the surface. So just an idea of, of what kind of problem, and that could be any invasive, colonia um, or, or any litany of them. So um, I'm keep I'm constantly looking out through those fire scars um, for other invasives because that's not exactly something I'm an expert in. And so any strange plant that I see in some of these um, fire scars, I, I always bring back to the office, uh, show them to folks that know more to, to try to keep after and make sure we don't have another explosion in there um, that, that's not as dramatic as the polonia that I may not be noticing. 
Great. Thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, next, we'll have Kevin Fitzsimmons, the Deputy Forest Supervisor of National Forests in North Carolina. I think I need to unmute him, so give me a second. You should be unmuted, Kevin. All right. I just turned on my video, if that's all right. I oh, appreciate it. Does that work? Can everybody hear me? Yep. All right. Well, thanks for having me, folks. Um, and we've been listening a lot here. Some some background from me, and, and oh, I asked to be part of this. I appreciate folks um, letting me be part of it. Um, some quick background. Um, I started off as a uh, uh, practitioner. I was a long-term seasonal, long-term tech. Uh, I was a packer for the Forest Service, uh, River Ranger, Blaster, um, a lot of different skill sets. And between managing, line, and everything I've done, I've worked and worked, managed, or been a, been responsible for at some level as agency administrator for over 30 wilderness areas, six regions, two continents. Have my master's in it um, from University of Idaho. And the one thing I'll always say is when people ask, like, well, how do you do XYZ? The answer is usually going to be it depends. Because it, every scenario is a little different, every wilderness is unique and different aspects of what. The law says how they how the law was written, not like that. But the big thing that I always go back to on a lot of this stuff is um, relationships are the key. Relationships with your line officer is probably one of the most important ones. And five minutes before the party is not the time to learn how to dance. If you're still starting having conversations with search and rescue, your externals, your line officer on your effects of wilderness on the things that were talked about today when the event's happening, you're behind the eight ball. And they're gonna happen. Everywhere I've been, of all those 30, I've dealt with some natural disaster of all times. So one thing I was gonna to hope to do, um, instead of going, and also one other thing I am too, I am a line qualified read still. So I still am involved in that sense. Still work through those items. So I was just gonna open up the questions and different items um, and, be honest, just uh, try to have a dialogue. I know you're getting a lot of information thrown at you, but you know, if you want to take a tour inside my brain on how I think on um, disaster work and some of these items, what type of questions I ask, where am I thinking, and whatever experiences I've had in relation, whether it's body recoveries or different items, um, yeah, I'd like to open it up and, and start that dialogue, if that's all right. So if you have those questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box and we'll relay them to Kevin. Can you give us a blasting story for content? Sure, I've got a few. Um, well, one, being a blaster in Idaho, um, we blasted a lot of trails. Like uh, we worked through that, those items as well. If folks remember on the Middle Fork, um, whenever that got blocked with 900 people behind it and rafts um, on the salmon and, uh, and what was going on there. Um, there's a, we blasted, uh, we blasted that uh, blockage out, but there's a lot of discussion between the line officer, us, and, and what that would look like while 900 people sat behind a river that was, water was coming up and in places that weren't, they, the resource wasn't built for. So, you know, everything from it's going to take 600 airplanes because there was an airstrip, you know, again, wilderness had an airstrip further down. And hey, this is a natural event, fire burned up and it slid. And we wrote the MRDG to blast that. We only wrote it for the drill because explosives is allowed in wilderness. So, um, you know, the MRDG at the, well, MRA is now, the MRDG at the time was, wrote, was written for the drill itself. So um, that's one that we had to go through and work through on that one. That one, that one was a was an interesting one. Um, can you give a couple suggestions, recommendations of how to work with line officers and agency administrators? Yes. Um, first, when you become a line officer or something like that, you're, you always have a specialty or something you're, you're good at. And maybe folks aren't used to that. And one of the biggest things for folks to realize, this is something that always kind of annoys me. Everyone always thinks that wilderness is a recreation thing. It's not. It's a resource. Everyone's got to play in it, 
um, just like general forest area for forest. So it's a resource. Um, you gotta start having those, those relationships and scheduling time with your line officer to talk the scenarios we're talking about today. It's like, hey, what's your comfort level with X? What's your comfort level with Y? How, if this happens, how do you feel about these things? Um, all of them from fire to allowing motorized to body recovery to work on search and rescue. All those items play into this. So um, that relationship with your agency administrator needs to be pretty strong. And also they need to understand where your resource is coming from. But as they talk about the bigger picture um, of what they're working through, um, you would have an understanding of what they're facing in regard in regards to those discussions, right? So those are all things that it starts with just being people. Like on North Carolina, for example, there's there's nine line officers. Man, a lot of us are probably 85% on the same page on different stuff, but you're gonna have that little difference. And and when you deal with a stressful event at any time, if you haven't worked through it or been involved with it or have that relationship, um, it's gonna cut it's going to probably bring out that other 15% of a difference of opinion. So, and you got to work through those opinions and you got to get to people at different places. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, um, I was the acting district ranger on the, well, up on the Kawishwe Ranger District of the Superior. Um, I had a uh, kid woke up next to his parent and they just they died during the night the parent did and we have those of you know the superior we have float planes well you know was it emergency anymore technically no um so the wilderness piece of me was looking through that piece but then also the the human side of me and and as and some of the discussion to go treat that in a certain way um and, and looking at that um, trying to look at all the books and everything else and the four soup at the time called me up and, 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 and asked me a question. I was like, hey, Kevin, by, by at eight, nine degrees, trying to pack that person out through, through boats and everything else with their kid and life, does wilderness win with that? Now, that's a, that's a different conversation, right? Does wilderness win with that action? You know, so that kind of thing is perception. Like, are we going to make a friend or are we going to make someone who, you know, is, is it going to be a different place? So those are the type of things that, you know, that I will change my perception from agency administrator to program manager and, and working through like the bigger discussion piece on some of this stuff. Still have the conversation, still work through it, still think about it, but then look at like the broader concept of what that is. Um, what does the current blasting program look like? Heard it may be in decline. It is in decline. Um, there is some of those things going on. Uh, there's a dealing with the blasting in general in the Forest Service. That's as much as I know about it, I have not been following it as closely as I used to, but that's what I know. It's weird not hearing voices. Let's see. External political pressures can sometimes drive emergency decisions making. Do you have examples and did wilderness win? Um, yeah, that's true. Um, there's a, there's a, that, that's real and that's discussion. So part of that is having those relationships beforehand. Um, example, uh, you know, I heard a lot of discussion about search and rescues and MOUs and people want to go straight to paper. Um, you know, on whenever they work through some of that stuff. And so before you start trying to build an MOU with a search and rescue that doesn't even understand who, when you're looking at competing emergency situations where your, your resource needs based on human life, what they're charged to do, if you're not understanding where everyone's coming from as a, as a professional, then we, we need to get there first. So having those relationships first before you go into paper, the wilderness will win with that. Um, you need to get people at what makes it special, why is it important, um, and also recognizing you know, and what scenarios it would be. So, you know, we had an MOU where I was a district ranger in Montana. The MOU, because we had snowmobiles always going off cliffs into the wilderness. We had to go recover people and things. And so, you know, the, converse, the conversation got to a point with search and rescue where through the MOU, you know, they knew what I was looking for and what I needed to say yes. Like, I have a phrase, they helped me say yes to you. So, um, 
we talk through what yes look like. And so that, you know, that is a, uh, that's important. And so I would get, we got to a point where I'll be honest, I'd get a text and within 10 minutes, if I don't respond to the text or have a discussion, um, they, I gave them a green light to go. That's my job to be responsive to their needs. And every time they did a great job. And one thing we don't talk about is how many people self rescue, how many people you run into coming out that never get reported. We always focus on the 5% where we're dealing with you know, an emergency response, but there's been, I've been at least 10 times as much as people taking their own cells out from 90 year old grandmothers to different facts. So, you know, it's that 5%, how do we help them do their job? And the world has gotten a better place because of it, I think. Um, a lot of incidents occur within wilderness before the agency is notified. Um, if we were showing up after the fact, what are the types of information we should be collecting for the agency administrator? Um, probably the biggest thing is going to, one, to say, hey, we, whenever you're dealing with these things and, and it's thing like wilderness and just something that folks don't always think about when they're thinking about their resource only, and whether it's fire, whether it's a, uh, I've dealt with fish projects in wilderness where they put things out and different things. Um, and I've dealt with uh, search and rescues. So there's different factors internally and externally that we're working through that. I strongly encourage, I always use it and strongly encourage people to co with this stuff from a place of honorable intent. And meaning that if you come at it hard without trying to, even, even if it happens three or four times, um, if you come at it hard, it, you know, a lot of times they'll put people in their corners and they'll, they'll start trading paper. But if you keep working at it, working at it, and they get, they get to know you not as a forest service, but as, you know, as cabin. And that always helps a lot to get you where you want to go. And you start working through and we explain the why. This is why we need to do this. We don't want to have to bring a heavy hand. So help us. This is why we need X. This is why we need Y. And, and come with solutions and, hey, if, how about we work out a way where if you're in the middle of something, you could shoot us something, we can work through it. Like, kind of like the text thing that we came up with. We were in the middle of nowhere. You know, I might be out seven days myself and they can't get a hold of me. I might be doing something else. So some of that's important. All right, Cruz, what are you throwing at me here? Been my understanding that MRDG is proposed actions, which include prohibited uses. Using MRG as proposed actions for none of the alternatives are prohibited uses. The point being a document, the minimal tool decision. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to, my glasses are see here. I'm reading this as I go here. My view on that, um, so that's a, that's a line call. Sometimes like it's a, it, it varies. It depends on some, some folks will look at that as a, by law, it's a prohibited use, but sometimes MRDG is, uh, is an educational example. I'll give you an example. Um, our explosives is a good example. So it depends on local understanding of, of the resource and what it is. Um, in Idaho, like Mr. Nobel came up with explosives before the CrossFit saw was developed. So you know, a, a bomb mule was pretty, pretty common and it wasn't prohibited use. And uh, while you look at something that's kind of front and center that the public might be dealing with and not used to being around a tool like that. This is just, this is Kevin's view. I said you might get five or six different answers. Um, we did do an MRDG for um, blasting in some extra steps on a uh, on a boat portage system. Um, that's an example. So, but in an emergency event, um, that's a different ball game. And so, um, you you as you folks know, you track your landings and you track use of motorized use but that's a different conversation as we work through that but to have the conversation before the disaster happens is probably one of the most important things what is it how is it what's important what are the values at risk what are they i mean your fire folks have got a lot of information that's been handed out from i mean that that could probably help with that and get them involved with those scenario plannings is key like help them understand your resource just like you need to understand that Hey, Kevin, this is John. Can I uh, add to that answer as well? Sure. Uh, yeah, and and you, you're right on to the non-emergency versus non-emergency and emergency in that particular question. I, I would say um, 
MRDGs are a great supporting documentation for any impacts to wilderness character, uh, which depending on the project, I'm gonna go back to the first thing you said, which it depends uh, whether an MRDG is needed or not. Uh, but if there are, you know, at, at some line, there's impact to wilderness character that we need to document our thought process mm -hmm. and, and acknowledge what we're doing and the trade-offs we're making uh, between the four, the four or five qualities of, of wilderness character. Um, that's part of, uh, I think, the answer, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it with, like you said, it depends in a lot of cases. But the exact, and it is that discussion point. It is that, you know, you've got to be looking at what that use might be and where it would be. You know, and their impact and impact of wilderness character, how we look at that, how we measure it, what is it, who did the measuring, I mean, all those things factor, right? I mean, what's allowed by the law in that wilderness? Right, John? Some of those some of those things are allowed in different scenarios. Airplanes, right. land, airplanes land in Idaho. One of my favorite quotes from Ken Straley, who used to be the Carhartt rep, uh, Forest Service Carhartt rep, was sometimes prohibited uses are the minimum. Uh, you know, it's there, there's a lot of other things that factor into it, uh, and a prohibited use might be the right answer sometimes. And sometimes, so here's another thing, folks, to think about if you're working in different places and you're going to different places, Anoka in Alaska plays a whole different ballgame on what's allowed. Border Patrol policy along, along uh, different scenarios, like if you're working in, I mean, in, in different areas that we've had to deal with with Border Patrols and, and different governments, all that plays in. So it's, it's tough, but, but have the conversations is my point, how have the relationships. Any final questions for Kevin? Great, thanks Kevin. Um, I appreciate you taking the time. No, oh, and folks, I'm around so I've I'm always glad to have these conversations, whether philosophical or legal or whatever, if we all work through them. So it's good. They're important to me, too. All right, Kevin, you just made the short list of wilderness presenters in the region, just so I just keep that in mind. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Appreciate that. So, yeah, thanks. Awesome. Great. Well, from there, um, I'm going to move on to talk about some of SAWS's experiences as a partner uh, responding to natural disasters in the Southeast. And so once again, I'm Katie Courier. I'm a program manager with Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards. Um, I oversee our trail crews, but then I also run our crosscut saw training program. Um, and so a lot of times we pull resources from all different programs. We have wilderness rangers, wilderness specialists, volunteers, trail crews, and also training services. Um, and we'll pull from all those different resources uh, to respond to natural disasters, depending on the situation. So um, the first, I've got three uh, natural disasters that I just kind of want to share what our response looked like. Um, and we'll start with um, Big Laurel Branch. Um, and so this was in 2016. Um, and so this will be the first disaster that I talk about because although SAWS had responded to disasters in previous years, this was the first one during my time with SAWS. And so in July of 2016, a microburst ripped through Big Laurel Branch Wilderness, um, and that's located in uh, northeast Tennessee, just west of Watauga Lake. Um, and re initial reports indicated that there were approximately 200 trees down across the AT um, in about a seven mile section. And so SAWS began immediate collaboration with Tennessee Eastman Hiking and Canoe Club, um, which is the local AT maintaining club, as well as the Forest Service. Um, and our goal was to shift our paid trail crew efforts to this area to respond in a timely manner. And within a couple weeks, uh, SAWS had redirected two six-person trail crews uh, to spend five days clearing trees. And 
One of those crews was funded by the National Forest Foundation and we worked closely with them to let them know what was going on and they were able to give us permission to change our grant um, so that we could address this natural disaster. Um, so I was also, we pulled in some single resource wilderness rangers um, from a few, few locations across our landscape um, to spend time out with the crews. And by the end of the hitch, the trail was passable, um, but there were still some trees that would need to be addressed at a later date. And so we sent program managers and some wilderness rangers out a few months later on a couple overnights uh, to address the remainder of the trees. And so this was a really good example of collaboration because SAWS was able to focus on the AT in wilderness, which then allowed the AT Maintaining Club to focus on other sections of the AT that had been damaged outside of wilderness and the Forest Service could focus on their roads and non-AT recreation areas um, to respond in a timely manner. Um, so I think one of the big takeaways for us from Big Laurel Branch was as a partner communicating with our funders um, because they may be flexible to allow partners to assist um, on the most immediate needs of public lands. Um, and then the next uh, disaster that I want to talk about is the Maple Springs fire. And this was in Joyce Kilmer Slick Rock Wilderness. Uh, David Finnan talked about this a bit. Um, he was the reed during the fire and we were brought in um, for post-emergency response. And so um, the 2016 Maple Springs fire damaged 24 miles of trail within Joyce Kilmer. And luckily, National Forests of North Carolina acted quickly um, and submitted and received ERFO funding from the Department of Transportation uh, for a variety of work across the district that was caused by fire damage. And so the trails in Joyce Kilmer were a part of this funding request and the Forest Service asked SAWS to partner um, in completing the work within the wilderness boundary. And so a challenge cost share agreement was created um, and SAWS has been able to mobilize uh, a six person crew for 20 weeks of work in 2017, 2018, 2019, and now 2020. Um, and, you know, when Kevin was talking about the Cohutta, um, it's similar um, in that, you know, from those fires, we're seeing a multi-year response and issues can compound because of the initial disaster damage. So just because we have a fire, that doesn't mean that um, the, all the damage that's happened is what we're dealing with and we're not going to deal with anymore. You have to think about the fact that, you know, storms are going to come through and those trees are weakened or you're looking at landslides or whatever else. So just being aware that more work may end up on your plate and, you know, planning for years out, like Kevin talked about. Um, and so through in-depth collaboration between SAW staff, um, Forest Service District staff, forest level staff, and other partners, uh, we were able to identify um, and repair trail issues throughout the wilderness area. And the work has included log outs, tread repair, trail structures, and reroutes um, to create a more sustainable trail system. And, you know, I think the big takeaway for me with the Joyce Kilmer um, work and the Maple Springs fire is that, you know, the initial effects of the fire were devastating to the trails, but our long-term response has led to a more sustainable trail system within Joyce Kilmer. So these natural disasters can provide an opportunity for us to create a more sustainable um, trail system. Um, and then the final uh, incident that I want to talk about is Hurricane Irma. And it's actually 2017, I forgot to change the, um, the PowerPoint, so I apologize. Uh, but John talked a little bit about Hurricane Irma earlier. Um, you know, it happened in September 2017 and Northern Georgia was hit hard, including sections of the AT. And I think about half of the AT in Georgia goes through wilderness. Uh, so 
there definitely needed to be some wilderness focused response there. Um, and so once it was safe to be on the ground, local maintainers and forest service employees uh, scouted areas and reported the damage. And, you know, like John said, due to it being high trail season on the AT for through hikers, um, clearing the AT was a, of higher priority. Uh, but there were also limited resources for wilderness specific work in the area. And so GATC, Georgia Appalachian Trail Club, um, ATC, the Forest Service, SAWS, and other partners began daily calls to dis discuss response and scheduling. And SAWS staff, ATC staff, and GATC volunteers went out and cleared the hardest hit section in Blood Mountain Wilderness uh, within a couple weeks of the hurricane. And you can see in these photos, the first one on the left is the before, and then the second one in the middle is kind of a part way through um, clearing, but it was pretty gnarly in sections. Um, and then, you know, John did put that call out for national support and we were able to bring in, or he was able to bring in some single forest service resources from New Mexico and a crosscut team from Montana. And that single resource forest service employee from New Mexico was able to provide crosscut training and certification uh, to some GATC volunteers while he was in the area on his detail. And so between all the resources, you know, the section of the AT within Wilderness um, was opened up using all traditional tools in a pretty, I would consider, timely manner. Um, and, you know, SAWS, ATC, and GATC um, and the Forest Service post Hurricane Irma um, began more collaboration to increase opportunities for wilderness trainings and crosscut certifications um, to increase those wilderness resources on the Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest. And so I think that was a great takeaway um, from Hurricane Irma was just increasing those resources in preparation for the next natural disaster. Um, and so just a few things from a partner standpoint that I want to point out, um, you know, for other partners as well as, um, you know, Forest Service employees that are potentially going to have to respond to a natural disaster is don't wait to get trained, you know, whether that's crosscut, a read, opportunity, um, get that in ahead of time so that you're ready to respond. Um, you know, I think some of the other presenters said this, but don't wait to build those partnerships and nurture them. Um, and don't forget to reach out both from a partner standpoint, reaching out to the land agencies and the land agencies reaching out to partners, um, because you won't know what resources are needed or available unless you ask. Um, and yeah, so that's about what I've got. Um, I think I'd like to open it up to some questions and also if folks have comments um, on experiences that you've had, partnerships that have worked well, or funding that you've pursued um, to address natural disasters, feel free to share those in the chat box as well. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll have all of the uh, presenters available um, to answer these questions here. Uh, so it doesn't just have to be for my section. Hey, Katie, this is John. Can you also put up the evaluation link right now just so folks can know that that's there? And just a reminder, as I started off the, the presentation, um, this, is, this is new material for us and I, I'm really thankful to everyone that, that presented and everyone that joined. But any feedback you can give us on this particular course, you know, we're doing this in two hours, uh, whether you would want to see something larger or uh, what you would like to see out of something related to this topic would be really helpful as we plan future trainings. So Kevin just wants <laughs> to remind folks um, to know how BEAR works and understand it and have other resources um, 
be thinking of wilderness when the evaluations are occurring. And I'm going to unmute all of our presenters so that um, that way you can respond. I don't know if you have capabilities to do that. And just to piggyback on what Kevin said, same with ERFO, uh, which for those that don't know that is, I believe it's emergency relief of federally owned roads. So it's not a program you would normally think of that you would work on in wilderness or work with uh, in for wilderness projects uh, when you start talking about roads. Um, but there are some subsets of your trail systems that are available for that ERFO funding. Uh, and it's important to be a part of that from very early on because there's a small window of when they need to submit the request through the Department of Transportation and they do an assessment of what the damage was. And it also has to hit a certain uh, financial threshold to be eligible for ERFO funding. So if we can say, uh, Joyce Kilmer in this particular example, uh, it's kind of a unique wilderness trail. It's a trail class four, I believe, um, maybe even higher in a couple of spots. Um, that has a development and has a probably a higher financial value than some other wilderness trails, but I know we have some other trails like that. Uh, and work with your engineering staff. I believe those trails can be uh, modified uh, off and on as to what's on the list and what's not. Um, but that's an important one as well. Uh, and that's that's big money too. So uh, like you, you saw some of the, uh, that one feature that SAW has put in, uh, it's a it's a good pot of money to be available for uh, if if you can. And uh, Kevin or David, there's a question in there from Plinio about uh, bear teams and part of the read response. Could you can you guys speak to that a little bit? <clears throat> yeah, I, I can. You, usually, we're. I, it hasn't been my experience that we've been a part of the. Uh, bear process. Um, I can tell you some of the professionals that are part of it if uh, if you'd like. What, what do you think, John? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, provide what you can and if that doesn't answer the question we can we can try to, to figure it out. Okay, so you've got hydrologists, you've got botanists, um, you've got uh, uh, fisheries biologist, um, you have a uh, oh, shoot archaeologist. I think that may be it. it yep, that that I'm aware of. Um, but usually the read isn't a part of it. Um, usually by then the repair work has been done, um, or is in the process, and so it, it becomes two separate things then. I can, yeah, I can add. Important. Go ahead. This is Kevin. I think one thing I would say, being being an ex part of a bear team, um, and working through some of that stuff, a lot of times, uh, that's where the relationship with the line officer comes up big. So the line officer is instructing the read, saying, "Hey, be, and it's the read's journal. Like uh, you've got to have good documentation. Like, hey, we have this impact over here. Um, notes for bear because the bear team will look at those notes from the reads. And the line officer will can can work with them and the engineers too because usually engineers are on this team too looking for erosion controls and things of that nature so um working with the line off saying hey if that's what the relationship that discussion beforehand comes up big it's like hey when when we have x we need you to be thinking about these items if that helps answer that and that helps instruct the bear team when they get their delegation of what they what they're going to look at does that help answer anything it's my experience of what I try to do. And, and I can also add, and this is uh, Kevin, um, my experience as a read was a bit different than uh, David since um, mine was a large incident on my home uh, unit. And um, I was very involved with um, the Bear team. Now, I wasn't a member, but I was with them in a part of the discussions and the meetings. And I was also part of all the field trips that they did where we went out into the, the fire scar and took samples and things of that nature. So it's not outside the realm of possibility. And just as a recommendation, I, I, I've never been a part of a bear team actively, but 
I would recommend if you're in that role, um, you know, as they're identifying what the bear work's going to be, is pull out your wilderness stewardship performance guidebook and talk, it, you know, you can go through all these elements about the work that needs to be done. And if it's connected to what needs to be done as part of this fire response, you could, you could structure it in a way that there's wilderness benefits uh, and it's, and like uh, Kevin said earlier, it's not just recreation resource. It's lots of other stuff out there that you could, you could make those connections to.